Okay, thanks a lot. So basically you have to switch on the projector. Okay. And now it looks like black. Okay, thanks a lot. How is everyone? Tired? Early in the morning? No. Yes, I see some nodding. Okay. I, I'm personally tired. I don't like 9 a.m. lectures. Uh, that's not the worst in the world. Um, So the uh, room for the exam is now sorted out after after more angry emails. Suddenly it was very quick. Uh, okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody. So we we go again through um finite projective planes today uh and how to construct them and maybe show uh that this construction is indeed yielding a finite projective plane but uh also like what is the 3d model of this why why does it work there is a geometric interpretation that i find very useful um and then we go to um probability and probabilistic proofs um, and this is a little bit of a topic which is difficult to capture because it's a specific technique rather than that it would be applied to to like a specific object right so typically when we go in mathematics we study a certain object let's say graphs and then we figure out more about graphs or we have topological spaces and we figure out more about topological spaces but the probabilistic method is more of we have a certain method and we try to apply it to lots of different things. And uh, it is a little bit all over the place and disconnected and you don't really see connections. So therefore I, I decided to have only two examples uh, where this probabilistic method is used. And then we go straight to Ramsey theory um, and we, we proved Ramsey's theorem uh, and it is, uh, according to Matuszek, the first application of uh, the probabilistic method. It's also a, a case where um, we do not know um, any alternative proof. Um, yeah, and and so it's maybe also a very important result to know um, because there's a whole, I say this, research line just trying to have similar kind of results in extrema combinatorics and Ramsey theory is like the most basic one of them. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I think this section was called construction of finite projective planes or of existence of finite projective planes. Okay.
Okay, and and you remember we had this field K. And and then uh, we defined the set T, which is uh, K to the three except this zero 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 vector. Um, and uh, then we defined this equivalent relation, so we said uh, some vector v equals uh, x y t equal uh, is equivalent. So I don't know what I used in the lecture, but Matushek uses this symbol, like curly brackets, um, to what did I call it here? X bar y bar t bar. If and only if. Let's call this w. There exists the lambda element k such that lambda times b equals w. Everyone remember this? And then we have some examples, for instance, 1, 2, 0 is equivalent to 2, 1, 0. And, and typically, because our field here has only the elements 0, 1, 2. Uh, uh, there are not that many people per class, per equivalence class. So equivalence class are everyone who's equivalent to me. Um, so we typically don't multiply with 0. Can someone tell me why lambda here should never be 0? Yeah, then so we have just vector times zero equals the all zero vector, but what's wrong about the all zero vector? It's not in our set. So we have only one and two. So basically, if you use one, it's just the vector itself. So that's not interesting. And if it's two, then it's just. So everyone has just one other vector that we're equivalent to in this field. In other fields, we have more. Um, so, so from this uh, equivalence relation, we can go to uh, equivalence classes. And from there, we can go to representatives. And and we had this rule that we just want to have a one as a first non-zero entry at the last non-zero entry. Uh, and here was this rule: uh, a one at last non-zero entry. Okay, let's recap that as well. So let's say I have this vector one. To two, so what would be the representative? And then uh, so this is a vector, and that's a representative. Okay, uh, I think we got that. Um, so this whole thing here, these types of coordinates, they're called uh, homogeneous coordinates for the computer scientists, but you don't need to know this. Um, okay, and, and then what we have is uh, that T, I don't know what you call this, divided or, or modulo, this equivalence class is is a projective plane. Um, and and that thing here just means only the representatives. Or for those who are not so familiar with taking these uh, factoring out by equivalence classes. Okay. 
So then we uh, drew all these points of, of our little projective space. Um, so here we have uh, Here we have the last component equals one, and that's basically just like the the cross product of k, like k squared. Uh, and then we have these t equals zero, and that kind of corresponds to uh, th this is l like I, I put this into uh, quotation marks, like the Euclidean plane. And this is like the line at infinity. But these are just, uh, how to say, ways to think about it. Um, and then we had this point, we had four points, one, zero, zero, one, 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 and two, one. Uh, these were all the representatives. And we can play, uh, yeah, uh, we can play some games. Namely, we can uh, we can draw two lines, and then we can see where they meet um, at infinity. Um, that let me do that as well. But first, uh, what is the order here? You remember the definition of order in a finite projective plane? The so order is the number of elements in a line minus one. And and here you can also see where this comes from because the order will be three and it's also the cardinality of the field. So the order is here. And uh, the number of points is 3 squared plus 3 plus 1. And that's also exactly the formula that we had before. So that's good. That's what we wanted. So those things are good. And now let's, let's draw a line. So um, I don't know who are you. Or do you want to give me two points here? Well, just tell me two points. Zero, one, one. Like, okay. And one more. Two, two. Okay, so we, we should have a line going through that two points, right? Uh, and then... It should go through another point in the Euclidean plane, and it should go through one point uh, at the line at infinity. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is uh, now you have to do calculations. Okay, so who shouldn't have done that? Um, okay, let's leave these calculations. Calculate the line. Uh, so that let's move this to the tutorial because I think we would take like ten minutes now to do it. But I think you will be capable of doing it. And my prediction is that you. Uh, find that this point will be on it as well. That's kind of how I feel about it. Um, and so this direction, right, it's like 2, 1. So I think this point will be on it as well. But this is just my gut feeling. Um, 
so that yeah make it a question mark um so but how did we define lines l a b c is um the set of points So let's write pk squared uh, such that ax plus by plus ct equals zero. So that's that's the definition. And and using using this definition, you can uh, now you plug in some points here, like those two points, and then you have uh, some linear equations to solve, and then you can solve for a, b, and t. Uh, sorry, a, b, c, uh, and uh, yeah, you should get a unique solution. Yeah, so you may think there are two solutions, uh, but uh, that's not entirely true. Um, because, okay, there may be more than one solution, but they may represent, they will represent the same line. Okay. Um, so now this is how, far we got uh, last time. And now what my claim is, is that this p k squared uh, is a finite projective So now what we have to do is we have to show that uh, we have to show P1 and P2. And uh, so Matushek here pr proves P1. Um, so let A, B, C and A bar, B bar, C bar, uh, two different lines. Um, then what we want to do is we want, need to show, right, uh, need to show uh, there exists exactly one point x by t uh, on the line. Was was this uh, with exactly one? I have to check. Yes, yes, exactly one. Okay. Okay, so we define this matrix M. And uh, we want to solve this M times X, Y, T equals uh, yeah, so we multiply the vector P and then we want to get a zero. So that's what the point need to satisfy. And in order to do this, uh, what would we do? So mathematicians should have that in a certain algorithm that mathematicians study a lot, typically, at least I did in the first year. You, you do Gaussian elimination. 
right? So here we would use um, would use uh, Gaussian elimination. Uh, I guess you had Gaussian elimination, maybe not by this name, but uh, you know what it is. Okay. Um, the computer scientists, did you have Gaussian elimination? They didn't, okay. Uh, but the idea is as follows. What you do is that uh, you just solve the system in a systematic way. Right, this is a system of two equations and you solve it in a systematic way and uh, you basically try to bring this matrix in a diagonal form and then you can just read off the solution. And you know while bringing this in a diagonal form, you do not change the solution. Um, but, but what we do is that we determine the rank of M and that's exactly two. So, um, now, it cannot be larger than two, simply because the dimension of the matrix is only two times three. So it cannot be larger than two. Um, but it must also be at least two, because these two vectors are different. They are not linear dependent on each other, because this is exactly the condition that we have on, on two lines not being the same. Uh, okay, there we set it with points, but it will obviously, uh, if there will be multiples of each other, then they would describe the same set of points and they does the same line. So that's why we have a rank of this matrix too. Um, and so now let's look at this e equation now again, x a bar plus uh, y B, C bar plus T, C, C bar equals uh, the zero vector. Um, then actually, um, you, you could kind of ignore this. Uh, can be ignored. And still, uh, you would have a solution. Oh yeah, so maybe I should say this. Uh, so there are two vectors linear independent then. So rank says how many vectors are linear independent. And here we have two columns linear independent. That's, we know this. But if there are two columns linear independent, then there must be also two, uh, sorry, if the two rows are linear independent, there must be also two columns linear independent. And let's say without loss of generality, let's say A, A bar and B, B bar are linearly independent. I, I will somehow make this into an exam question such that you will not rely too much on linear algebra, or I, I will give the, the specific knowledge about linear algebra that you need as a hint for the exam question, so don't worry about this. And so, since their vectors are linear independent, now for any V it holds that X A A bar plus Y B B bar equals V has a unique solution. So this means um, that we, if we want to point, find points, uh, we can find point X and Y, or, or you give me some T basically, and I can find po point X and Y such that the whole thing ha has a unique solution. Um,
So now there, uh, if I have a point P that is the solution, so let's say P is the solution, then I can have also a P, sorry, basically a different representative of P where let's say here T is one, then I can have two times P, which uh, is the same vector, right? It's the same point, but it's a rep different representative. Then we would have T equals two, and uh, that would be a different representative. But uh, then X and Y would uh, uh, still have a unique solution. So whatever T you pick for X and Y, you get a unique solution. And we know that we can scale T. OK, so maybe I'm going a little bit ahead of myself, sorry. So maybe the first, we can ignore this unique, but given that there is a solution, it follows, uh, yeah, we have a point. On both lines. Uh, and and the issue for us is more now to um, make sure that there are not more points on it. And and for that we need to use the uniqueness. Up to scaling. Okay, um, so this shows P P one. So this shows P one. And P two is is uh, analog. Uh, and for P0, let me do this here at the very bottom. For P0, just check following points 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 1, 1. Uh, they give six sixteen lines. Um, okay, so Matushek says, uh, isn't it nice that now we, we can use linear algebra and makes our life so easy? But on the other hand, it's also a little bit like waving a magic wand, like linear algebra says, that there's a unique solution and we're done. Um, yeah, so that's that's sometimes a little bit annoying if things come out of, out of just a... Uh, uh, a little bit out of nowhere uh, if you don't know linear algebra. So uh, I guess you can go two ways about this. And now I would like to show you the geometric interpretation. Um, let me use colors here and, and let's make this as large as possible. So that's uh, uh, like here we try to uh, represent uh, our projective space and instead of K3 we use R3 divided uh, or factored out by the same equivalence relation. Um, 
And so we still have this uh, t equals one plane. So let's say this is t, and here we say equals one. I have to try to make these lines parallel here. Okay, so this is a t equals one plane. And and what we have is that if we take any point, right? Uh, uh, we can find typically a so let's say we have any point a, b, t, and if t is not zero, then we we can find a representative. Uh, with something, something one. So, for for most of our points, they have a representative in in the plane somewhere. But uh, we also know we can scale this point, right? And it would it would give us the same point. It would just be a different way of representing it. But typically, we we say our representative is is in is with we have a one. But really, if we look at the whole class of for this point here, it is like everyone, right, on this line. So let's call this V. And these are, this is a set of lambda times V or lambda not equal to zero. So this, is a, this is a line uh, presenting a point. Let's say line in R3 representing point in our projective plane, real projective plane. So far so good. So let me repeat. We we start with this R3 and we take us any point that has um, that as last component doesn't have zero. Then if we look at the equivalence class of that point, then it's everyone on this line here. So you could also draw the line below, but okay, let's forget about it. So everyone on this line would represent the same point. And we typically decide to choose a representative uh, as this guy. But really everyone on this line should be a rep could be chosen as a representative as well. Um, and then we have other other points. So there could be a point here. So this is, uh, let's say, W equals uh, a, oh, sorry, x, y, uh, zero. Um, so that's a t equals zero plane, right? And here the same holds. Uh, so typically, then we would uh, take the. Um, well, okay, let's not go there. But what happens is that also this whole line here, line in R three represents again. Point in P R squared, uh, and here we would just take the, uh, I guess the x equals one.
representative. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Very good. So that would be our representative. Thank you. Uh, my coordinate system is not is not good. Yeah, I guess. Wait, how do you do it? X Y. Uh -huh, maybe I was right to draw it here. Just should have written a Y here. But okay, but okay. Aha, uh -huh, so X Y Z. Okay, yeah, but it's it's T anyway. It's uh, something completely different. Yeah, you're right. Uh, okay, so so now we understand what what points are and their representatives. We have forgotten one, um, namely when t and y are zero. So I guess last color. Uh, so these are if t equals y equals zero, right? And then x equals one would be the representative. So that just would be this unique vector zero, zero, one. Uh, sorry, one, zero, zero. This would be one, zero, zero. And so what we think of as we think of all of those points here being on the Euclidean plane and all of those points here being at the points at infinity. That's like an easy way to think about it. And uh, those guys here together with this guy, we are like line at infinity. And I put this into quotation marks. Um, and what we need now is what are um, what are lines? Um, in this 3D model. So we said the line in the projective plane would be something like L of A comma B comma C is a set of points X, uh, X, Y, T such that A, B, C times X, Y, T equal zero. So now people in computer graph, uh, computer scientists should have seen this in computer graphics. So this is a scalar product or this is my notation of the scalar product. Um, how does this look like? In R3. Let me start easy. No matter what ABC I have, can you Tell me this one point that is in here. Yes. Very good. So the not point. Um, 
So here we have, uh, so let's mark this green and, and obviously this point is in here. Um, uh, half of this is correct. It's a plane. So this is just a plane. I'm not good at drawing planes, but uh, ooh, how do you draw planes? So let's think we have uh, two vectors, no matter where they are, and uh, like everything's bent by those, right? Anyone is good at drawing 3D things? So like you have a, you have a, 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 your coordinate system and somewhere lies your plane. And it can lie in many different ways. And the way that it lies there gives you, uh, uh, gives you, yeah, it gives you a different line. But uh, note here that this plane goes through the origin. Maybe green wasn't the smartest choice here to use as a color. So maybe I use blue somehow. This is not sensible, no? Is that sensible? I think not. Uh, let me maybe try to erase this. I draw, I draw a new picture. Hopefully that makes more sense. Uh, namely, I draw the uh, t equals one thing. So this is t equals one. And, and obviously one plane is special here. Can you see which, among all the planes that go through the origin, uh, there's one that is special. Very good, yeah. So there is, uh, let's say this special plane. So, uh, and it's described by, I guess, one, one, zero, no? Zero, zero, one, I guess. Yeah, because I don't care what X and Y are, I just want to have T equals zero. And this exactly gives T equals zero. We can check this. Uh, zero times X plus Y times, uh, plus zero times Y equals one times, plus one times T equals zero. So this exactly tells us T should be zero. And that that line uh, corresponds to the line at infinity. Um, and if we take any other line, so any other, so maybe, yeah, so lines in PR3 correspond to lines through the origin uh, in R3. And for any other line, take, take some other line, it, it kind of intersects this Euclidean plane in a line as we want it, right? Uh, yeah, this becomes like a, a intersect t equals one in a line. <clears throat> so 
so that that is our 3D model for the finite for projective planes, uh, specifically for the real projective plane. Um, but so I pointed out there's this t equals one which we see as Euclidean plane, and there is is the other thing uh, this this plane which is parallel to it, which then represents a line at infinity. But really, that's an interpretation. And what we can do is we could have also said we take a diff. I mean, but there is no. I mean, in no way in my definitions was T having a special role, right? Only when I said this is my representative. But really, that that was a choice that I made. I could have chosen a different representative. Um, and this is not something that's written by in Matuszek, but I think it's important to point out. Or, or maybe this is written in Matuszek, and then I, I point something out on top of this. So um, uh, all lines are mathematically equal. This Euclidean plane and a line at infinity this is pure interpretation. Interpretation. I think this is unreadable. Okay, let me rewrite this. Um. And now what we can do in, in finite projective spaces, uh, we can rotate them. We, we can have linear mappings um, that preserve the origin. Uh, and this, let's say, extra information. So um, I could have, uh, you know, points plus lines in uh, R3, or let's, let's call it P R squared. Um, and then I have a, I have a map, uh, a linear map from R3 to R3. And this uh, gives a new interpretation So maybe the way to think about it is, right, so we have here our special, this is our special uh, uh, plane that we say, this tells us where, where is the Euclidean plane, which points we interpret as, Euclidean planes, which points do we interpret as points at infinity. And we move it, right, and then it's it's maybe somewhere here. Note that it cannot go through the origin because uh, otherwise we wouldn't have a linear map, but an affine map. Uh, and suddenly, maybe some points that were at infinity go to the Euclidean plane, and some points that were at the Euclidean plane go to infinity. But the points and lines in three dimensions stay the same. This only changes our interpretation.
And and Matuszek gives an illustration of this. Which I wanted to give as well. OK, so we are over time again. It's only two pages of my notes. Uh, but you can think of train tracks. Train tracks. Um, and and you know, we we represent them in in R three by just adding this extra coordinate and homogeneous coordinates, and then we change our interpretation. And suddenly, this whole thing here becomes like this, kind of the, the core example. And and if we think about it, we don't see we our our vision is not like this. Our vision is more like that. And and we there's somewhere here this line at infinity. And we move that line here. And all that projective transformations are doing, they're moving lines at infinity somewhere else. And and suddenly you know, these two lines here that would meet at infinity because they're parallel, they meet some, suddenly somewhere where we can see it. And this intersection point is there as well. And that's why it's so useful in uh, computer graphics to have. But then you have to do it with one dimension more. But if you do any movement of camera, it means you move the plane at infinity because then you're in three dimensions. Um, but lots of things where you don't want to deal with lines at parallel lines, um, you you don't have to because uh, because you you work in this projective space, and suddenly uh, lines uh, 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 parallel lines they're not an issue anymore. They do meet, and suddenly all these calculations also become very easy. Okay, so we go now to the break. We meet again at ten zero zero. Um, and then we start with probabilistic proofs. <laughs>